Hello and welcome to the Open SAP course Efficient DevOps with SAP. Week 1, Unit 2, Cultural Aspects of DevOps. My name is Dirk Lehmann. I'm a Chief Development Expert at the CI/CD Product Management here at SAP. In Unit 1, we have learned about the CALMS acronym and how it describes the main principle of DevOps. In this unit, we will focus on some aspects of culture and why it is so important for DevOps. Speaking about DevOps, many people associate with it things like process automation, deployment pipelines, containerization and other technical terms, which is not wrong, but it's a limited technical view on DevOps. Imagine you successfully implemented all these technical measures with a high degree of automation all over the place in your company. At the end, those tools and technical measures will not provide you with the full poten potential, with their full potential, if you don't care about the people which are involved in those processes. Imagine your deployment pipeline can build, test and verify any change within minutes, but at the end, your command and control based process frameworks require some higher management person to authorize any change being done in the productive system. And that normally takes hours or even days. Any speed that you have gained by all the technical measures that you did along the process just vanished by the culture and the processes of your company. So you need to address culture to leverage the full potential of technical changes or measures you do inside your process. So we need to talk about culture and be warned up front. Technology is the easy part of DevOps. Culture is the tougher nut to crack as it's hard to manage or even change. People don't work as structured as project plans might indicate, but humans actually have pretty complex relations and we need to understand a lot about how social structures work and a lot of psychology to understand how humans work and how we can address culture. Looking back into the banana corp, which we already know from unit one, if you ask those siloed functions on what could have been done to improve their work, most of you will pro most probably get a lot of good suggestions. And none of them are wrong that I've listed here on the, on the slide and they can or even should be looked into, right? And they also did that and they um, half down the time, the, the, the lead time of, of these individual silos. But as you've also learned in unit one, it's less the individual silos that needs to be improved, rather the collaboration and the structures between those silos. And we, as we need and want to apply system thinking in DevOps. So we need to improve again the complete value stream rather than focusing on individual um, selective silos. And one thing that can be a booster or a killer for, those for such a collaboration is trust. Now, why tr is trust so important? Well, let's turn it around. The non-existence of trust, you could say, is the root of all that's evil. Imagine a group of people not trusting to each other. I'm pretty sure you agree with me that it is hard to imagine that this group can work together as a team or work together very effectively. Patrick Lincioni wrote a best-selling book called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, where he illustrates that many problems in dysfunctional teams can be traced back to an absence of trust within the team. People that don't trust each other avoid going into conflicts, as they are afraid of personal consequences. Their ideas and thoughts by that are not reflected in any decision that the team makes. So this fear of conflicts leads into a lack of commitment and accountability, as the person's voice is not represented in the decision. So why should they commit themselves to something that does not reflect their point of view or, or their knowledge? This is just one example why an absence of trust will lead to dysfunctional teams. Trust is important for healthy teams so that everyone's voice is heard and incorporated. But what is trust? There are a lot of great definitions of trust out there and I wanted to introduce you to one by Dr. Tway Jr. In the paper, A Construct of Trust, trust is defined as the state of readiness for an unguarded interaction with someone or something. I think 
this is a nice one sentence definition of trust. And it also shows that you can not only feel trust to some person, but to something like a system or a process. And also Dr. Tway comes with three pillars that build up trust. The first thing is the capacity of trusting. If you have flown a hundred times and you know the system of aviation quite well, you have trust in the system of aviation. But what if you have flown, what if this is your first flight? You have no personal experience with aviation at all, so you might not feel very comfortable. And um, the more, but the more you fly, um, the second flight, the tenth flies, the hundredth flies that, uh, uh, that you do, the more you will pay into the aviation trust account, so to say. But also, if you have that, you also need a perception of competence um, to feel trust. Um, what if you have flown a hundred times in the past and everything worked out fine, you perfectly moved from A to B, but you need to feel competence in the crew of the plane you are just boarded. Um, otherwise, you would lose trust. So you need to feel and perceive competence of the people that uh, or the systems that you want to trust. And last, the perception of intentions is required to feel trust. Even if you have flown a hundred times and you think the crew on from the plane that you just bought it looks very competent and you feel competent in them, but what about their intentions, right? Maybe they can fly the plane, but once up in the air, maybe they want to do some crazy loopings or zero G curves um, that you don't want to have. So um, you always need those three things to come together to feel trust. So uh, you need some kind of like history with that person or system um, that helps to feel trust, then a perception of competence and a perception of good intentions. But how can we measure trust? In DevOps and as engineers, we like to measure and quantify things. And here, um, we can make use of what Stephen Covey uh, wrote in his book, The Speed of Trust. Trust, if trust is added to a system or a group, it always accelerates things. It always speeds up things, being it negotiations, uh, processes. Those things will work faster whether they work on a command and control based structures. Command and control based structures are always slow, whereas trust based structures are always fast. So you basically need, can, can look into the, the speed and performance of systems or groups to, to judge how much trust is in that system. So trust is important and we need to ask ourselves, how can we foster trust? And I give you here three um, advices how you could foster trust in your organization. The first thing that you need to look into is team size. Team size matters because communication matters. Um, this comes from, from a book written by Fred Brooks called The Mystical Man Months, where basic the baseline of that book is adding manpower to a late software project makes it even later, which is somehow counterintuitive, right? What we experience in everyday life. If you dig a hole alone and it takes you one day, um, if you then have a friend helping you dig in that hole, it most probably will take you half a day. But in software craftsmanship, it is, seems to be completely different. If you have 10 people working on a software project and you add another 10 people, it's not, it's not half the time that it takes, but most probably double the time that it would have taken that 10 persons to, to write down the software. Why is that? Brooks describes that, this problem um, and says it's basically mainly on the communication that happens. And he comes up with this intercommunication formula that basically goes up by the square. The more people you add into a team, the communication goes up by the square. So in this example, if you have three persons, you have three connections, four persons, you have six connections, five persons, you have 10 connections and so on and so forth. So at some point in time, the amount of communication efforts that the team requires is just too high and productivity will break down. So that leads to the question, what is a good team size? And here can help the work of Robin Dunbar who is an anthropologist and evolutionary psychologist who came up with the so-called Dunbar's number, which is a cognitive limit of the number of, uh, um, is a cognitive limit to the number of people with whom one can maintain stable social relationships. Now, what does that mean? 
Dunbar found out by looking into social structures of all kinds of, of, of sorts, like villages of Stone Aged Man. Um, if you look into those, you will find out that the maximum size of those villages could host around 150 people. And then it seems like they, they split it up into different villages. Um, also in the militaries, the smallest tactical human of the Roman army, the so-called money pale, had a size of around 150 people. And you can see that in all kinds of social structures that, it, that you always see these uh, at 150s group that, that are high performing, that are, try to avoid bureaucracies and hierarchies split up at this somehow magical numbers of around 150 persons. And important is not only this 115, what Dunbar's num this Dunbar's number, but also what Dunbar said about trusted stable relationships. And here Dunbar says every person or the average person can maintain about 15 stable social relationships. And um, there are five intimate friends. This is this five, this, this number five at the, at the very beginning. So every person has about five intimate friends and then 15 trust uh, trustful, stable, trustful relationships. So if you subtract those five intimate friends, you'll, it leaves you with an additional 10 persons where you can maintain stable, trustful social relationships with. And now this is the scientific explanations why we always talk about teams of 10 or many people say um, about seven, eight persons, that should be the number of what a good team size should be. This is the scientific explanation for this. It's basically related to the work of, of Robin Dunbar. So team size matters, but also diversity matters. Um, Henry Tafel, uh, also a psychologist, worked on theories about social groups and how social groups are created and how people feel being involved in groups. There are formal groups and informal groups, like a formal group is you sign a contract with a company, then you are part of a formal group of employees of that company. Informal groups is like you just feel related to a football club that you support, but you are not a member of that club or whatever. You just feel related to that. That's an informal group. And his experiments now revealed that virtually meaningless distinctions between groups, such as preferences for certain paintings, uh, colors of their shirt, can trigger a tendency to favor one own group to the expense of others. And this became known as the so-called minimal group paradigm. I explain you a little bit what the experiments that have been done again and again and always showed the same results are all about. Imagine you have a room and in front of that room you have a bunch of people, all strangers don't know each other and every time one of those people enters a room you um, give them a shirt, they should wear a shirt, whether a red shirt or a green shirt, you decide by some random process, you flip a coin or whatever, so basically completely random they will get a red or a green shirt and you don't tell them why they get a red or green shirt and that this is completely random or what you aim to do with them inside the room. You just they enter the room, you give them a red or green shirt randomly. Um, and then once everyone is in the room wearing a red or a green shirt, you give them a choice. You, you, um, you let them make a choice. Either they could distribute a reward in that sense that everyone in the in-group, so everyone wearing the same colored shirt as them, um, would get 100 euros as well as all the other people, so wearing a different colored shirt. Everyone, basically just everyone gets 100 euros. One option, or they sh the other option that they could choose is everyone in their in-group, so everyone wearing the same colored shirt gets a 60 euros, and other everyone wearing a different colored shirt gets only 40 euros. Now what you would logically most probably expect is most of the people use A, right? Because then everyone gets 100 and not only just 60 or even 40. But what most people do actually, and these experiments have been conducted again and again, is they choose B. As I said, people that don't know each other, picked completely random whether they wear red or green shirts, decide to go for B to give their own group, their in-group, an advantage over the out-group, even if it goes to the expense of their very own group because, you know, everyone could get 100 euros, but they want 60 euros for their own group to get some advantage of their own group. And you need to understand that, that people um, and our brains just, just work like that and we need to, um, this is not good or bad, but we need to understand how our brains work and how we relate to groups and what does that mean when we create um, functional silos 
um, just, just of one professions and then maybe put them and locate them all over the world without direct connection and social interaction with other groups. This is basically destroys our value stream. Last thing that fosters trust is safety, psychological safety, failure culture. We need to understand what failure is. What most people think is that failures are somehow a D route on our way to success, right? Um, I have my position where I'm at now and this is where I want to go to reach my success point and I just need to go a straight line and avoid any success. This is basically what a lot of project uh, management tells us. But if you are honest to yourself, and I'm sure you had your successes in your past, being a private or, or business side, you would, I think, agree with me that actually, in most cases, especially for complex problems, it is like you stumble from one failure to the other, you try out new things, you turn around, you make some tweaks, try out new things, you fail again until at some point you reach a point that you could say later on, well, that was the success point, right? Failure and success are always things that are often judged when looking bad and not projected into the future, but looking into the past saying, okay, that was a failure, but then I turned this way and then it, uh, that was a failure again, but here I reached, I reached success. So we need to understand that failure is not the opposite of success. But failure is a precondition to reach success, especially in complex environments. There's also a research on this. Google had a project some years back called Project Aristotle, where they tried to find out why some of their teams were high performing, why others are not. And what they found out that what, what the data called then psychological safety is more than anything else critical in making a team work. Um, and to feel psychological safety, um, people must share things, their, share their vulnerabilities, things that scare them, things that, fears, um, that are fear to them, um, to, to show that they are vulnerable. If people show especially that leaders um, are voluble, uh, um, vulnerable, um, they also come up with their weakness, their weak points, and then they feel this psychological safety. They understand that failures that they did are just um, being part of a normal process and it's okay to do failures. So we need to look into failure culture and we need to establish this, this thing, what they called in that study, psychological safety. So what we, did we learn in this unit? Culture is very important in any DevOps transformation that you do because it is the thing that fully leverages the potential of all the other technical measures that you do. Um, and we learned how trust can be fostered in teams. Think about the team size, think about diversity, and think about psychological safety and failure culture. Again, here are some links for further reading for your reference. And with that, this is the end of the unit. Thanks for tuning in and see you in the next session where we discuss about organizational design patterns.